So in the last section, uh, we talked a little bit more about how to make plots and multiple plots that may be on top of each other. Um, this is well and good for places where it might make sense to compare data in a very explicit way. So you plot them on top of each other and see if you can see any trends. Sometimes this can be really confusing, though. Um, and so you find yourself wanting to plot a massive number of different plots at the same time, perhaps in a grid. Um, so there's a really simple way to be able to do this, and it comes in really handy. Um, and it also makes use of um, something that we learned last week, which is how to write a for loop. So I'm going to show you how to make a large array of plots at the same time. So you can plot many, many things at the same time without writing the same code over and over. So let's start again by our sinusoidal function. And this time, we're going to start with something slightly different. Um, so what we're going to start with is a um, horizontal axis, or just all the numbers between negative 1 and 1, counting by 1 thousandths. And we are going to plot y as the as a sine of, of, of x normalized so that we get exactly one period for every one unit. So if we plot this, what we get is the following plot. So you can see on the horizontal axis, we have numbers between negative 1 and 1. We have the sine of those numbers. And it goes through exactly one period between 0 and 1, and also a, a second period between negative 1 and 0. So this is good. It's something that has a period of 1. Now, if we wanted to make a plot that has a double that period, so we go through two full oscillations between 0 and 1, what we can do is multiply the argument of the sine function in here by uh, a number, fi. And so fi I've defined above as the number 2. So what we're doing is plotting now a sinusoid that has twice the period that we had before. And if we take a look at it, it looks like the following, right? Count the number of periods between 0 and 1. You see 1 peak, 2 peak. It does exactly two periods uh, in between these. So what we're going to do is say, well, let's. Well, I wonder what more of these look like, right? Um, so if we wanted to plot a lot of these plots and do this in an automatic way, and I'm using this just as an illustration of something you might want to plot over and over again, what we can do is use the subplot command. So the subplot command works in the following way. Um, it gives you the ability to plot a lot of figures in a lot of subfigures inside the same figure. Okay? So the way it works um, is that we're going to define a grid system inside the figure. So what we've done up until now is make a figure. So here's my figure. And we have a set of axes that takes up the entire figure. Now what we can do with subplot is divide up this figure, this figure that we make by the figure command, into a number of subplots. And we can plot individual things, different things, on each one of those subplots. Okay. So the numbering system works the following way. You are going to define a grid of subplots. And you're going to tell it how many rows I want and how many, and how many columns I want. So let's say that I want two rows. right? So here's row 1, here's row 2. And I want three columns of plots. Okay? So 1, 2, and 3. And in each one of these little portions of the figure, I'm going to plot something different. It's going to be a set of x and y axes in each one of these little grids. And what I'm going to do is refer to each of these subplots by a numbering system where I'm going to count here subplot 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to continue counting down the rows, 4, 5, 6, because we have a total of six different subplots. Okay? So if that's a little confusing, it'll become clear in just a second once I show you what it actually does in the code. So I have a figure, and um, I'm going to say subplot. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell MATLAB the size of the subplots I want. So in this case, I have two rows and three columns. Okay, so that's how many grids I want, and I want my plot to occupy. Let's say to start the first position. So the third argument tells you which out of this grid of two by three, which subplot do I want to be in? Okay. So if we run this, what's going to give us is the following. Okay? So think of this divided up just like uh, the figure that I drew on the board over here. So I, 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 should, I would have positions 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6. Okay? So that's a 2 by 3 subplot. And I've specified that I want my plot to occupy position 1, which is why it's right here. If we change that number and say, let's say I want my plot to show up right here. 
Okay, so it's going to be one, two, three, four, five. This is going to be fifth position in this particular case. So if I type in a five here, right, this should do what I want, and it's going to make my plot show up in the fifth position on the bottom row, in the middle position in the bottom row here, just like we specified here, right? Um, so this allows us to make a large number of plots, an arbitrary large number of plots, actually, um, automatically. Okay, so what I'm going to do is try to populate all six of these plots in an automatic way by writing a for loop. Okay, so they're all going to show up in the same figure, so I'm going to make a figure, right? And inside the figure, uh, I'm going to populate each of these six positions with a different plot. So I'm going to start writing a for loop. So uh, my counter is going to be called i, and I want i to be between 1 and 6, because remember, there's six slots that I'm trying to occupy. Right? Inside each of those uh, slots, I'm going to make a slightly different y function. So I'm going to make a y function that uh, is just like what we had before, and I'm going to make it of a different period. So I'm going to make it the period of i. So I'm going to make it a period of 1, period of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? Um, and then I'm going to specify which subplot I want to be in. So out of a 2 by 3 grid, I'm going to occupy the ith position. And inside the ith position, I'm going to plot x and y. So let's see what happens if we run this code. Here we go. So I've made six plots that are on the same figure. They are in a grid of 2 by 3, and they increase from 1 to 6 in the periodicity of the sinusoidal function that I'm plotting. So here's a period of 1, period of 2, period of 3, period of 4, period of 5, and period of 6. Okay? So um, the same uh, functions we talked about last time still apply to these subplots. Basically, each of them functions as an entirely independent set of axes. So I can have an x label and a y label for all of them. So let's see what happens if we do that. Um, what we can do is then label each of these axes and say x label x, right? And y label is y is y. Let's try that. And we'll give it a title. And it's going to say, just say sign. Okay? So if we do that, uh, what I ended up doing is labeling every single one of these axes. Okay? Which is somewhat redundant, right? So for example, if you are making this figure for some kind of a report or a publication, um, it's redundant to label each of these uh, y axes in the same row. So what you typically see is uh, you, you label each x, as, each x axis redundantly, or maybe you only do it at the bottom, right? And you label only these two y's here. So we'd like to be able to do that. And we'd like to do that in a way that doesn't involve us doing it by hand, OK? So what we're going to do uh, is do a little bit of math to figure out when we want that y label to show up and we don't want it to show up. Because going back to our grid, we only want the y label to show up in position 1 and position 4, right? So what we can do is uh, write an if statement in here that says if mod i3, because I know I have three columns, equals 1, and that totally moved my cursor because I want to be right here, uh, equals 1. Then I'm going to do the label. And if not, then nothing happens. OK? So mod of i3 means what is uh, the remainder of i divided by 3, right? So um, 1 divided by 3, one, 1 mod 3 is going to be 1. And then 4 mod 3 is going to be 1. So those are the only two positions where I'm going to end up with a y axis, OK? So we do that, that did what we want, right? So I have a y label here and a y label here, but no y labels in the other positions, right? I can do a similar thing where we can get rid of at least some of these x-axis, because that's also kind of redundant in this plot, right? So we can get rid of these x-axis and only keep the ones in the bottom, because we only want an x label if we are in positions 4, 5, and 6, right? So we can write another if statement to determine when we want to apply the x-axis label. And that's if uh, i is greater than 3, so in the 4, or 5, or 6 positions, right? So we can apply that, and, uh, and that should do what we want, OK? Here we go. So we've labeled the plot in a nice way, even though now it's in a much larger array, 
right? So we have X labels in the bottom and Y labels over here, and we're not wasting a lot of space by using redundant labels, okay? So next, what we want to do is uh, label the periodicity of the plots in some kind of sensible way. So one nice way to be able to do that is to, uh, let's say we want to label the periodicity of the sinusoidal function in the title, right? So that would be a nice thing to do. And again, the key to this, the whole reason we're doing this programmatically and with for loops is that we don't want to type stuff. We don't want to type stuff over and over. It is both a waste of time and also a really good way of making mistakes. Because if you change something up top, then you have to change everything down below by hand. And it's a really good way of inviting bugs into your code. So we want to do things programmatically in a way that uh, is generalizable as much as possible. Okay? So what we're going to do uh, is um, instead of using a string as the title that we've already typed in, what we're going to do is construct a string for the title that reflects the periodicity of these plots. So I'm going to show you how to do it. Okay? So the way to do it um, is, the way I prefer to do it, um, is I'm going to construct a string, okay? And the string is just a vector of character. So I can literally concatenate characters together in order to make another string, right? So I can say uh, the frequency equals, and I want a number to be the next uh, part of the string. But I need to make that number into, from a number into a string, right? So I can say num to string of i, because remember up here on line 9, i is what I'm using to be the periodicity of the sinusoidal function. OK? So now that I've constructed my title, let's run it. And here it is, right? What I've constructed is a nicely labeled set of subplots right, of sinusoids of different, of, of different periodicities. And I've labeled each of these plots with a title that tells you exactly what the periodicity of the function that's being plotted below is. OK? Uh, a couple of more nice things that you can do with these plots. Um, uh, one thing that's really nice, if you have data that you're comparing, where sometimes it matters exactly you know, what's horizontal and you want to be able to uh, plot your plot on a grid, for example. Um, to do that, uh, we simply have to call the grid function and turn the grid on. So here we go. Here we go. So now I have a, a set of nice functions where um, the, the MATLAB has already automatically decided where the grid lines are going to be. And there is a way of changing it, but that's uh, a little more involved. Um, but if you simply call grid on, usually the, the grid lines show up in fairly sensible locations um, that allow you to compare your data in a more um, quantitative way, visually. Um, and that's really helpful for certain things you might want to do. Okay? So that's sort of an overview of um, from just plotting from just x and y coordinate points to plotting some fairly sophisticated things and then labeling them in sort of a nice way. Um, so there's a lot more that you can do with plots. Um, what I like to start with when I'm making a new plot is usually I sketch it out on a piece of paper what I want the plot to look at. And if it involves doing something that I don't know how to do, I go look for how to do it, rather than being constrained by the things that I already know how to do. Um, and for that, there's a really nice resource um, in the documentation section on the MATLAB. So I wanted to show you that because it's a really important way of trying to figure out what you want to do. It's, uh, it's part of the workflow to try to figure out how do you make the plot that you want to make the point that you want to make, rather than being constrained by the tools that you currently have at your fingertips and you've memorized. So the resource uh, is if you look in, uh, if you look in MATLAB, um, there is an extensive and very well written set of documentation explaining what every single function does. So I'm going to show you what this looks like for the plot function. Okay? So one way to get to it, there's many ways of get to it, you can also click on the top of the bar and go to documentation, is that um, you can say doc and plot. Right? So that's the function we're working with, plot. What are all the different things that I can possibly do with the plot function? So you call doc of plot. And uh, what that's going to bring up is the uh, documentation for the function plot. And uh, this is a really good resource because reading this documentation will both remind you how to use the function. If, you've, you know, if it's something you don't use very often and you've sort of forgotten what the arguments are, here's a place you can find it. And uh, what I find to be super useful is uh, being able to being able to look at all the things that you can specify with your plot that you may not even realize was possible for, right? So for example, down here, let's say that um, you wanted to um, 
you wanted to specify um, uh, to specify the line width marker size or marker color, right? So remember we did a plot before, we had different kinds of markers and we could change the color by specifying the RGB. What if you wanted to change it so that the color of the marker was different from the line that is going through it? Well, you can do that. But if you don't remember how, you can click on this tab and uh, there are examples here in code where you can read it and uh, learn how to make different kinds of plots, right? So here, for example, I'm just going to go through one example because I think it's sort of illustrative of the kinds of thought process you would go through in order to solve this problem. Is that let's say you want it, you have data, you're going to plot it, you can plot it just fine, but you want the markers to be a certain color and you want the lines to be a different color, right? So here, what they have plotted in the example is uh, X and Y, just like we did before. Um, the third parameter kind of specifies that um, they want um, dashed lines connecting all the points. The G specifies uh, the color gray, and the S specifies that the markers are going to be squares. So that's what you see in the example below. Now, in addition, they specify the line width to be two, so it's a little bit thicker. You can specify the marker size to be 10, which makes them a little bit bigger. You can specify the marker edge color so that the edge of each marker is blue, whereas the middle was gray, as specified before. Um, and you can specify the marker face color. And they've explicitly specified that it's this particular gray that they want rather than any other gray. So a lot of aspects of the plot can be specified specifically if you knew how. And the way to do it is by going to the documentation, reading the documentation, and figuring out what sets of parameters you would need to change in order to get the plot exactly right in exactly the right way you want it to be. Okay? Have fun. <laughs>